Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Welcome to the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, hello, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, hello, friend. Hope you're having an amazing day. Uh, you see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts. You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So hit that subscribe button and join us as we change the world. I'm here with my good friend, Robert Zaft. Uh, how's it going, man? Very well. Very so, busy. So good to see you. Uh, you've had an exciting uh, couple of months. You moved across the world. Tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll dive into DOJ stuff. My wife and I met overseas. Uh, we spent much of our, our life and marriage moving around the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we went back to my hometown of St. Louis to put the kids through junior high and high school, which was wonderful, but we had resolved when the uh, nest emptied that we would resume our expatriate ways. So we, we've we gone overseas, although the, the nest has temporarily filled itself uh, with one child who's taking a, a an intensive coding course. And so we said, look, don't worry about anything but your course. Take over my, my home office and make that your bedroom for the time being. So we're happy to have company. That's cool. Yeah, little room still in the nest. Uh, so you guys were expats when you met? Yeah, my wife and I met in St. Petersburg, Russia. I was there on a business trip and my wife was there as a graduate student. Wow. So where did you guys meet? In St. Petersburg, Russia. Just Our first the- date was 12 hours. We went to the uh, Hermitage Palace. We went to the Yusupovsky Palace where Rasputin was murdered. Very romantic, totally, I know. Totally, yeah. <laughs> we, walked the, uh, we walked the canals and the banks of the Neva River and the White Knights. So. Wow. Well, you know, when that first date is a 12-hour date, that's... Uh... That's a good sign of where, of things so. to come. That's cool. Um, so now you're now you're in Israel. Tell us about how you chose Israel and you know what that move was like. Well, my wife and I wanted to move, and we were thinking at various countries that that interest us. I think Israel is a very exciting place to be right now. It is a world power in several leading areas of technology: artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, biotech agricultural sciences, et cetera. Yeah. It's just, and it's centrally located for all the places we'd like to visit. And we didn't have to get a green card. So it worked out for us. What, a, simply, uh, what a cool adventure. Yeah. 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 So, so you're dual citizens. Uh, you didn't have to get it, get a green card. I mean, that is kind of a, that that's a cool thing to do. I'd imagine to say, okay, the kids are out. Where do you want to go live? And then to wind up in another country and just, so what has that been like, like acclimating to the culture and what has the transition been? Because you've been there for a, couple, for a couple months now, right? We visited before. My son was was in the Army and the Special Forces. So we're in Tel Aviv, which is very comfortable. We, we love the city here. We can walk all over the place. We didn't want to have to have a car as right. part of our life. And a very exciting area. My, I speak uh, Russian. I'm learning Hebrew. I speak some French. So my goal in two and a half years, you can check in on me is I'll be sitting with the other uh, altar cockers in the town square, what have you, <laughs> speaking in English, Russian, French, and Hebrew, trying to solve all the world's problems. I love it. Well, those are those, those are, are some good ones to attack those problems. It's uh, a well, very that's dynamic great. place. We're yeah. happy to be here. Yeah, I've never been. I've always wanted to go. Um, so that's that's so cool. Anyways, right before the show, you mentioned yeah. uh, the DOJ is just the, get, the gift that keeps on giving, and uh, you've done some good work on that. So I'd love to dive into uh, right. that kind of stuff. Well, this was really prompted by one of your blog posts because you were writing about the challenge many compliance officers face, and that is they feel they're feel that they're being tasked with building a four foot shelf but only getting three feet of wood. Right. And so the issue was how do you demonstrate the importance of this to senior management and the board in order to get the resources necessary? And so an approach I have had success with working with clients is to leverage the Department of Justice guidance on evaluation of corporate compliance programs. And this is something that the DOJ came out with some years ago. It's been revised several times, most recently, actually, at the beginning of this month, as the DOJ comes out with new policies and memoranda. And it lays out, in a sense, the DOJ is saying, here are our cards on the table if there's a corporate compliance problem and we investigate and possibly think about prosecuting, here's what we're going to be looking at and looking for. And so within that promise is if you cooperate, 
uh, if you remediate, et cetera, will be very lenient. And in fact, they've gotten even more lenient with some, some very recent policies we can discuss. Of course, behind this is also a threat, which is if we show up and you've ignored the guidance, uh, we're going to come down on you hard. And so the advantage for the compliance officers vis-a-vis -vis resources is as follows, and that is my view, this gives each company an opportunity through its compliance department and its in-house and outside counsel to do an as-is and to-be analysis in light of the guidance. The guidance asks several dozen questions or says it directs the investigators to ask several dozen questions. And so I think what a compliance department, legal department would be well disposed to do is to say, well, how would we answer that question right now? What is the as is? And then what is the to be answer we would like to give? And what's the gap between the as is and the to be? And then what is the time and what are the resources required to move from as is to to be across all of these questions that the DOJ is going to ask. And, and that's an important framework because ultimately you go to the board, you go to the compliance committee, and you go to the CEO, and you say, look, here's where we are. Here's where we think we ought to be. Here's what we think we need to get there. You as the board and you as the CEO allocate to us the capital, the resources that we need to do this, in line with your highest level strategic priority. So what you are doing effectively is you're forcing the board and the CEO to make the appropriate strategic trade-offs of resource allocation, at least in full knowledge of what the DOJ is going to look at if there's a problem. Yeah, and so yeah. that, that has a sobering effect. Now you want to handle this well, in right. a way that, that is covered by privilege, but this appropriately allows the compliance department to inf allow the board and the CEO to make, I'll call it an informed decision about resource allocation. Well, I think that's where a lot of people um, fall flat, just to be sort of straight about it. I think a lot yeah. of them fall flat because they either, they almost bring, I mean, they they almost bring this sort of like adversarial energy to these kinds of conversations, yeah. and I, which is the kind of antithesis of like true collaboration. Asking those how and what, you know, those how and what questions make mm -hmm. my problem our problem because uh, that engages you sort of psychologically to start thinking about it in a, in a creative way. I mean, that's what's happening on mm -hmm. sort of a base, uh, you know, psychological standpoint. But I think the next step, which you just kind of alluded to, is to say, this is where we're at. This is where we need to go. And we can figure out which of these, um, which of these investments we think are most appropriate in the context of the whole business. If compliance, ethics, HR, whatever is going to ever move from uh, this sort of kitty table, as I call it, or this cost center thing, you know, something that's sort of apart from the business to being a part of the business, it right. has to engage like that because that's how those conversations are actually had. So what I love about this framework is that by its nature, you're sort of setting some goalposts of saying like, here's where we are today. This is like sort of the the uh, the promised land or this is like the sort of ideal state and these are the big things that that um that have to kind of transpire for us to get there and what i've seen right. a lot um is um many times the sort of compliance stick gets swung without like right. the context and the context is not necessarily like very very little of what we're talking about is black and white and many times there's some kind of implied you know risk framework that a CEO or that a board is going to be operating in that's going that all decisions are going to 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 run through. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so this at least allows for that kind of a conversation and that that kind of collaboration to figure out what that what that next best or like what that best path forward is with right. everybody's input. So it's not just on me as the compliance officer and it's not just, you know, on them sort of trying to, uh, you know, sort through the my whims. Exactly. In, in a sense, what you Bless you. You want to put yourself on the same same side of the table as your as your management, and your board, because you are really. Great and point. what you're what in a sense, what you're saying, if using an analogy, you're saying, look, the, the big bad wolf out there is the Department of Justice from a pure compliance and criminal prosecution standpoint. Now, do you want a house of straw, a house of sticks? Do you want a house of brick? Now, you may have some people who who lose the forest for the trees and they want a house of 
stone or they want a house of adamantium okay <laughs> so you you have to take a, a a rational risk allocation as to where you're going to put your resources for compliance and something i i fear that uh, government officials god bless them don't always realize is that a a company that has perfect compliance and does nothing is worthless right and so you can't so structure the company that it can't operate and achieve its purpose which is to generate returns for shareholders while following the law okay my sense of it is that the the heavy out there sort of is the government that this is not in the fancy of the compliance officer this is not some wish list divorce from operations you're simply saying look should a problem arise here are the questions the government's going to ask and here the here's what our current answers would be and and here's where we think that maybe the answer could be improved and this is what it's going to take now you tell us how you want to allocate what resources to these endeavors that that's an appropriate strategic decision to be made by the board and by the ceo not everything the department of justice is asking for makes sense for you to give it or you're not going to answer every question yes right. for right. example they, they at one point they have a question around uh, do you inspect the books and the records of your third-party vendors now or have a right to do so now the reason they ask that question is they're thinking about the foreign corrupt practices act and how do we establish that these are not grease payments or unlawful bribes that are going through the vendor to somebody else but realistically speaking you're not going to have a, a commercial conversation with many third-party vendors of, of reputation that are going to let you open that will open their books to you willy-nilly that's not going to happen right there's some other stuff in the guidance and they, they've strengthened it actually that talks about making sure that you communicate to your workforce the disciplinary measures taken against errant employees well the department of justice apparently hasn't talked to the department of labor okay and they sure as heck haven't talked to the the privacy lawyers who are saying you know what that's extraordinarily risky, if not unlawful. We have to be extraordinarily careful in order to release any information about supposed wrongdoing by an employee that we've let go. We don't want a defamation suit. We don't want to violate privacy. Uh, the DOJ has put a huge push now on saying, well, you need to have a policy about all your communications platforms and to make sure that these are have some permanence to them and that their that their records are maintained and so the records basically can be turned over to the government if the government wants them and so they've added a bunch of questions in the doj where that becomes a hammer to force the companies to put in place the communications policies that become a matter of contract with employees about how they're going to use communications devices etc okay but there are privacy rules you can't necessarily monitor the work desktop computer of an employee without worrying about privacy rules, both in the EU and in California and many other states. Okay. So you're not always going to say yes to the DOJ. Okay. But I think that from an alignment standpoint with your own board and managers, there's a lot in the guidance that can be used to develop the as is to be perspective, which quite frankly, lets the board and management make an enlightened strategic decision around resource allocation, which is what they're supposed to be doing. What it also means is you've had the conversation and compliance says, okay, they said we're not doing you know, the following things because there's not enough money this year or next year or ever and say, okay, we need to respect that decision. But it also means the decision has been taken at the appropriate level and the responsibility has been assumed at the appropriate level. I think the most frustrating thing that any human being has working in an organization is where you have accountability without authority. So that's how I see a good way to leverage this guidance. Uh, you do want to do it, make sure that you're doing it in a way that's privileged, right? You, you work with an outside lawyer, you run it with very tight communications through the inside counsel as necessary. You don't want this thing discoverable. Why is that? Well, because it might make you look really bad if before a jury, which is we knew we had all these problems and we didn't do anything about it. That's a determination that the company will make at some point if there's a problem about to what extent do we disclose voluntarily and what are we going to disclose? 
but that's the decision the company wants to be in the position to make. It doesn't want to forfeit the entitlement to that decision. Right. So if you have slack communications discipline and you have people outside the legal function sending emails around to each other, well, you know, what do you think about questions 17 through 22, et cetera, and you develop this email traffic, that's not going to be privileged. And now you really shot yourself in the foot. Right. So I think if, you, if you've done the analysis, you're saying as from a managerial standpoint, from a fiduciary standpoint, I as compliance have provided a framework for strategic decision-making with some real concrete basis to it. It's not just my wish list. This is what the government is going to look at. That's good. But you don't want to do it in a way that blows privilege. That's a very valuable asset of the company. And it's one, I think, that a lot of firms waste. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's true. But where do you draw the line? Like, what kind of framework would you would you have for that? I mean, is it just hey, uh, anything you didn't want to wind up on the front page of a court, sort of court case? I mean, what is the what's your framework for that kind of like? How do you tighten up uh, what you call sort of Slack email correspondence or Slack communication? You know, well, we we would start with training, and we would also have some processes. So people have to understand what is privileged and what is not within the context of their communications in the company. And, and people have to realize that if something isn't privileged, they have to pretend it's going to be on the front page of the newspaper. Or as Warren Buffett says, imagine that a reasonably intelligent journalist has gotten a hold of this. And Okay, people, that's a great framework, yeah. And also, I think there's a, I'll call it a generational shift that is unfortunate for companies and for the people who are working there. And that is, there seems a general reluctance among people below the age of whatever you and I are um, to walk across the hall and talk to somebody or to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. And so you get a, little, a lot of little email traffic or text traffic or whatnot that isn't really thought, thought about, consequences aren't considered. So when I'm training, when I'm speaking to people, when I'm devising processes, part of the training is to say, look, pick up the phone. Don't put something in writing unless you intend to memorialize it. Now, if you're writing to seven people across six time zones, okay, maybe you need to write an email so that everybody gets it. But any one-on-one -on -one communication should be done face-to-face -face first or by telephone, okay, or by non-recorded Zoom call. So it's a more effective means of communication. I'm sure you've seen and any number of people watching this have probably been suff have suffered from being CC'd on email traffic of people having an argument, arguing past each other, right. and it escalated to no purpose when if they could just picked up the phone, they could have talked it through and saved everybody a lot of time and aggravation. Well, that happened in our company yesterday. These two groups, right. both well-intending, both had their own priorities. Uh, there was like these tensions rising and we just got on the phone and it ended up not really being that big of a deal. It was like three layers of miscommunication that's kind of spiraled out for the last week that could have, to your point, just been handled just by having a conversation. So I, I think training, you know, rules about, you know, always prefer face to face, then go, you know, video non-recorded, then go telephone. And then if you need to memorialize something afterwards, then you yeah. send an email as we agreed or as we discussed. You, you handle it that way. That's one thing. Another thing that's important is uh, my own view is that when you have people who are working in the law, you know, in a legal function that should be privileged, that there should be a screen pop when you go to send an email. So you click on it, it says this is communicate privilege or it's not privilege. You have some lawyers now, it's fashionable in many companies, and I don't disparage them. I just I just note it. They want to have a business title in addition to a legal title. And that raises a question under applicable law. In what respect is someone consulting you? Are they consulting you because they have a legal uh -huh. question or because it's a business question? And the difference will, will decide whether it's privileged or not. So you might consider having giving people separate emails. So I've got a, you know, Zaft Legal. Zaft Business Affairs. Right. And then when you click on it, you get a screen pop that says, this is not going to be privileged. You know, do you understand this? Right. Or, or else what happens is if you're going to write somebody and you put Zaft Legal, and then you decide you're going to copy the entire world, you get a screen pop. 
that says that you, know, you may lose privilege as a result of this. Are you sure you, know, are you, sure you want to send this? So I think it's a combination of training, cultural shift, and as well as I think some relatively simple uh, plugins to email systems mm -hmm. to try to preserve privilege, which is a fiduciary duty and an agent duty of people who work for companies that they not waste a valuable company asset. Well, when you talked about it that way, that um, we want to try to retain the privilege so that we at least have the option of uh, making an informed decision on what privilege we are going to, you know, ignore or like let go of, or I, 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 don't, I don't know what the, what the, what the term is. Um, that just kind of shifts it a little bit because this is actually an asset for you. This is actually a valuable resource for you. It's a valuable corporate asset. asset. Totally. I just don't the, think a lot of people think about it that way. Well, I have to fault the legal department. I'm sorry if any lawyers are watching. Hey, no, let's just there's say no it's lawyers listening to this. So let's just say it's an opportunity for improvement, which is, hey, look, you know, you need to get to the IT person and say we are currently wasting a valuable company asset, which is privilege, and that we should, we must not waste this. It's we, it's not, we shouldn't do it. Now, I don't know if you followed some time ago. Boeing got off relative with a slap on the wrist for its, its 737 MAX planes that crashed. Mm -hmm. And it could have gotten basically destroyed as a company. It could have gotten indicted and convicted. It would have lost its uh, ability to bid for government contracts, which probably also would have undermined our national defense. Mm -hmm. But the fact is it was a company killing problem. But because they were deemed to have co cooperated with the government and taken remedial actions, blah, 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 you know, they got off with what was a modest fine of about $250 million for them. Uh, they also had to put about $2.5 billion into a fund for the victims and their families. Mm -hmm. But as, as corporate sanctions go, it was a slap on the wrist. The government, however, went after two mid-level Boeing executives on the notion or on the theory that they had misled investigator or FAA officials. And one turned state's evidence. And so the, you know, the full weight of the government with the full participation of Boeing went after this guy who actually got acquitted. Now, part of the reason he got indicted was he was very lax in his emails. And so he was boasting that through his Jedi mind trick, he convinced the FAA not to require simulator testing. And then he wrote, I, I lied to them. I didn't really, you know, I told them that it only did X. I found I just found out it did two X. Now you could impeach him because you'd say, well, you didn't really lie. You said something that wasn't true, but you didn't know it wasn't true at the time. And then the question is who had the obligation, if anyone, to correct the misimpression. Right. So the guy got he got acquitted. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm just I'm just gonna note though that the whole thrust of the government's approach, the DOJ's approach right now, is to give corporations every incentive to throw employees to the wolves. And there's big a logic point. to that. That's a big point, though. All right. So what I'm saying now, this now gives a different, a different timbre to the issue about your corporate communications, which is if there's a problem, the government has given your employer every incentive to turn on you and to turn you in. And so you need to be thoughtful about what you're putting down on paper. I'm not saying conceal wrongdoing. What I'm saying is People often say stuff they don't mean, or they say stuff they haven't thought about, or they say stuff that's not clear. And it's discoverable. And the government gets a hold of it, and they put it in front of a jury, and it looks pretty awful. For you as a person, as an individual. For you as a person. And, and, and the organization is not going to stand behind you. It doesn't make any sense for the organization to do that, because the organization now can get if it if it voluntarily discloses, if it cooperates, and cooperation is considered to be providing information on individuals, uh, it can get a huge discount on any penalties. It can avoid a criminal sanction, or uh, or it can have its penalties reduced by seventy five percent. Now, when Warren Buffett fired his right hand man some years ago uh, over trading in a stock in a Uberzol, I just I discuss this in my book. Uh, as part of what happened is not only did this guy quit because he was about to get fired, but Warren Buffett turned over all the files to the SEC. He said, here you go. 
you, right. you make the determination. Uh, I, I'm not saying that this guy did it. I don't think this guy did anything wrong, but that's what I think. I'm not saying that he did or he didn't. Um, but here are all the files. You, you know, we have not, we as Berkshire Hathaway have nothing to hide. Now, right. after right. two years of, um, of proctoloscope treatment by the SEC, the guy managed to avoid indictment. But you can imagine it probably cost him tens of millions of dollars. Right. Now, whether he deserved to be tried and convicted or not, I don't know. That, that's a let's assume not because the government finally decided not to do it. But what I would say is if his secretary had done the same thing he did by virtue of knowing his calendar, I think she would have gotten indicted. So this just making the point one, uh, privilege is a precious thing and you need to safeguard it as a loyal employee, right? Even if it's privileged, the, the company can decide to turn it over to the authorities if they feel it's part of voluntary disclosure or cooperation and remediation. So individuals need to be very careful what they say and do. Now, the best thing not to do is don't break the law, right? Uh, this is not a, a discussion of how to get away with stuff. I'm just saying that uh, people can say stuff because they're joking, because they're moving fast, because they're not thinking, they can say it in innocence, that, you know, and they can really later come to regret it. So I, I think that in my experience of training people on corporate communications, um, how to build a culture around the right communications, and then you know, some simple, I think, plug-in fixes that would help the organization preserve the privilege so it's an asset the board and the CEO can decide how and when to cash in, so to speak. So this shift um, actually, I think, allows for uh, the training to take hold at, at a deeper level <clears throat> because, um, I don't know, um, people care about number one first and foremost. And if there's an actual risk to themselves by not following this policy, I think you're going to get better sort of compliance from it. Uh, what do you think is driving this change? Is this just a secular change that's just happening? Uh, is it a company-driven change? You know, I'm saying the willing, the willingness to uh, throw them to the wolves, so to speak. Well, uh, you know, it's a government. The government has developed the policy, and the policy is understandable. Think of it this way: uh, Is it really fair to hit a company with hundred million dollar fines or billion dollar fines or whatnot because a few rogue employees did something wrong? You know, my sense is no. Why are you hitting the poor shareholders with this? Yeah. Okay. At the end of the day, it's the shareholders who are going to end up paying. So the notion is, look, uh, if we think, you know, if we look, we put, we apply our guidance questions and we come to the conclusion that you had a compliance program that was well designed, that it was properly resourced and authorized to act effectively, and that by and large, it was working in practice, right? It doesn't make sense to bring the hammer down on the company. So what we expect is we expect you to cooperate and remediate. Cooperate means turn over all the information you have on the people who are involved and we'll make a determination about them. And so there was a, a memo that went out some years ago that said that uh, the corporate matter cannot be resolved unless and until the individual matters are resolved. So there, there's been a trend towards going after the individuals and I think there's a logic to it. There's a fairness to it, okay? Uh, there's another trend, which is in the guidance and elsewhere, which is increasingly prescriptive language of telling companies what to do. And I don't think the government is always in a good position, one, to understand what companies should do. And two, they're not necessarily in a good position really to evaluate it. And we can go into more detail if you want. Um, but that, that's an issue I, I have. And then three, their government is trying to set up the, the conditions that will give it leverage in the event of an investigation. Witness the stuff we discussed about contractual obligations to preserve communications records, if you're using your own device, for example. The government is now also put in the guidance based upon policies that contracts with executives have, have deferred comp, escrow, and clawback provisions. So all of these things are giving the government some hooks to get in there and, and, and make sure that it has it has some um, some leverage when a problem happens to come out to go after individuals. So let's dive into those <clears throat> those yeah. deferred comp and those clawback things. I yeah. think there's a lot of debate on whether those things actually work in terms of driving the right behavior. Where do you think mm -hmm. like 
you know, how do you think people look at that? Like, what are kind of both sides of it and where do you land? Uh, well, I'll put it this way. The way the executives look at it is I'm going to insure against a clawback. Okay, so the way the clawback is supposed to work, generally speaking, is if I receive a, a performance bonus and it turns out that a restatement was required, which would have reduced or eliminated the bonus, I have to give the money back if it was earned, I think, within four years. Right. Now, in most cases, people affected by these bonuses are not going to be have been directly involved in, in intentional wrongdoing. Most cases, right? Yeah, you could have an entirely corrupt organization, but you'd say even within Wells Fargo, all right, maybe the president, maybe the head of the division. But so the fact is that's a risk that can be insured against. Now, what the, the government policy says, and by the way, the, the, the company is not allowed to buy the insurance for the executives to cover the clawback, which just means that the insurance uh, the, will be bought by the executives whose salaries are going to be increased a bit to cover the clawback insurance. Right. Okay. Now, I guess you're saying, look, at the end of the day, the, the shareholders were made whole. Right? And saying that the money went back, you know, it's kind of like scratching your ear like this. Yeah, right. Okay. And, and part of the question also is the, the company has some decisions to make about when and whether to go after clawbacks. I'm sure there are situations where they should have gotten every penny back from these people. And there's some other situations where it's just not worthwhile to go after it. Right. And these are some of the unfortunate things, things that happen in business. And people say, you know what? We're running a billion dollar company. Do we really want to chase these people for a few hundred thousand dollars? Because it's going to, lawyers are going to cost right. us more than and what we're going after. So, so maybe you say, oh, that's no problem now. You say you have a contractual right to call it, to pull it back and let the insurance company sue these people, right? The insurance company is paid out on, on the claim. So I guess they can go after people or they can say, you know what? This was willful wrongdoing on your part. It's not covered by the insurance policy. It's a carve out. But I mean, right? what's- You can't insure against your own willful misconduct. I mean, with that logic, um, it would mm -hmm. seem as if um, just from a deterministic perspective that the cause for that, you know, regulation or that sort of uh, provision is to make shareholders uh, whole. And I don't think that's really what they were going for. I think they're really probably going for, I want to put some teeth in this thing so that you executive are putting the circumstances in place so that these kinds of uh, misstatements, wrongdoing, whatever are uh, reduced. I would imagine that that's really the drive behind it. I, I, it's hard to read people's minds. What I could say is I could easily see a, a staffer in his or her mid to late twenties in the justice department coming up with this brilliant idea, which is we're going to stick it to those fat cats who are, who are getting these, these bonuses that they don't really deserve when they, re, when the stuff gets restated. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the person hasn't taken the next step to say, well, is someone is the company going to insure it? So they thought about that. And they said the company can't buy the insurance. What's the next step? Well, the executives buy it themselves. They probably get a group policy from a particular carrier. And unless they you know, willfully misbehave so that there's a morale hazard that they don't have, to, they don't want to get paid on their own personal policy. You know, the the others who are innocent or perhaps just merely negligent are going to be able to collect on the policy. And then the insurance company decide can decide whom to go after. So it's there's some stuff that happens that may be somewhat gratifying to some people, but doesn't necessarily move the needle any in terms of the larger issues we're facing. So since you, you raise the question, I'll, uh, something I'm, I'm mulling in my mind, I can't say it's a definite policy prescription. It seems to me that Warren Buffett's notion of not buying DNL insurance for his board members may not be a bad idea. Yeah, it might not be a bad idea at all. Actually, I'm also coming to the conclusion that maybe the board and the C-suite should all have to put virtually all of their wealth into the company's common stock, or that we get rid of the notion of limited liability um, for the for the directors. So that if we want people to think like owners, then they got to have an ownership stake. Right. I don't think that Hank Greenberg would have done with AIG what his successors did in terms of all these derivative derivative hedges he was insuring, okay? 
Buffett is a pretty careful guy. Right. Because almost all of his wealth is in Berkshire Hathaway stock. So it, it seems to me that what we're trying to do is not to fine tune little things around money flows back and forth because it's just not practical from a right. transaction cost standpoint. I believe we should be thinking harder about alignment and uh, something I look at is in Lloyd's of London, they have syndicates, right? These are the groups that do the insurance, the underwriting. And they're, and they're backed by names. These names are individuals and they, they back the syndicate's obligations to the full extent of their personal wealth. So as I think about Silicon Valley Bank and I think about Signature Bank and I think about Credit Suisse, I'm beginning to say, you know what? Maybe the directors of these banks and the C-suite ought to have to stand behind the debts to the full extent of their personal wealth then we'll see who wants to serve on a board. So that's an interesting question because uh, what's going on at those banks is uh, pretty nuts. And is it the start of something massive? Are they contained as everybody kind of wants us to think they are? Uh, it's definitely kicked off some new QE, some covert uh, quantitative easing uh, by the Fed. Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you, th I mean, it's just wrought with so many disincentives. Like it's all to your point. It's all, it, everything we're talking about is kind of incentives um, and, and yeah. how people respond to the sort of implicit incentives that are in place, you know? Uh, we're, in some ways, we're trying to build this extraordinarily intricate mechanical watch of compliance and corporate governance. And I'm just wondering, you know what? Maybe we just need the, a blunderbuss alignment approach for the directors and the CEOs and say, you're liable to the full extent of your assets. And if you don't like that, go find another job or change the risk profile of the company. Uh, you might say, well, then, you know, we're, the banking sector will collapse. I don't know. I mean, you, you have, you have play, you have bankers like Safra, right? A very famous uh, Sephardic Jewish family, Mizrahi Jewish family, I think. Uh, they own private banks. So, I would at least like that to be thought about or else what you might do is you might offer a reduced regulatory regime for banks whose directors and senior officers are liable to the full extent of their personal wealth for the obligations. And you'd say, let's just see how it goes. That's pretty interesting, actually. You know, maybe the banks will be more efficient in the long run. Maybe they'll be more durable in, in that way. I, I don't know. The Silicon Valley Bank, I published an article in my, on, on this in Forbes. Oh, you did? I didn't see it. Um, it's what, what is funny to me right now is we're having the battle, not over what happened, but over who can drive the narrative. That's exactly so, what's happening. <laughs> That's exactly so what's going on. Yeah. You have, Senator Warren says the problem is that Trump cut back on the regulations, but it's not clear that he cut back on the regulations that really would have affected this particular bank. You, you have Mr. Marcus of Home Depot who says the problem is these guys were so woke, they took their eye off the ball of actually running the bank. Okay. And, and I'd say, well, I, I can understand a certain appeal that you would say this, bear in mind two things. One is it was their progressive reputation that probably brought in a lot of business. But secondly, you haven't really made a strong causal link between the wokeness and the failure. Yeah, right. It, maybe it's there, but I'm just saying... I haven't heard that from Mr. Marcus, and maybe he can come back with a, a better reply. But uh, then you have other people saying, well, uh, it was stupid management or it was lax monetary and fiscal policy. So, and this gets more to the, you know, like Colombo looking at the murder weapon and the scene of the crime, this thing fell because there was a run on deposits. And there was a run on deposits for a couple of reasons. One is the bank had invested long in low yield government securities because the Fed had kept interest rates so low before now rising them, raising them of late. And the reason the government is the Fed has raised them of late is because the president and the Congress and in their infinite wisdom have engaged in massive deficit spending, right? Which forced the Fed to increase rates. So. You because, had the situation because it kicked with, off so much inflation. Right. So some banks that weren't careful were caught long on low yielding securities that they couldn't liquidate except at a large capital loss. Right. Because they they hold a security that might be yielding a half a percent and they're selling it in an environment where you can get 4%. Right. 
So you're going to take a big haircut on the sale of the bonds. And they're long yeah. dated, so they're taking on this duration risk because the the assets that they're purchasing are much longer dated than the the instant uh, deposits that they're you know matched up against. Well, these are these are marketable securities, so they're you can sell them, but you just have to sell them at a large loss. Right. And and so there goes your capital base. At the same time. It was the nature of the large depositor base at Silicon Valley Bank that these were companies whose cash was coming from equity investments. So it wasn't being replenished by revenues. And so, and you also had the investors in these startup companies who are VCs who are carefully monitoring their company. They're carefully monitoring the bank and they all talk amongst each other. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the depositor base at Silicon Valley Bank was very, very skittish. And it, and the deposit bank or the um, the uh, depositors were almost monolithic. They were all high risk. They were all uh, you know with what we would call kind of um, risk on type assets. It was crypto assets. It was startup right. assets. It was and they all kind of moved together because many of them were not uh, cash flow positive. To your point, they right. their cash flow was coming from investors as rates started to go up the relative value of like, well, I can earn sort of a similar yield elsewhere with less risk. It's just sort of inherently, like the yield chasing that has fueled yeah. us for the last 10 years yeah. was starting to be diminished as these rates started to go up. So obviously on a comparative basis, uh, in the face of, you know, some of those businesses winding down, the stock market, you know, essentially crashing, multiples right. on those types of business as an out, you know, as a uh, as an off-ramp or I guess an on-ramp to, uh, to, go, to going public, as all those right. things start to dry up, to your point, that's one group of, of there's not the, the, there wasn't the diversification that a, that a regional bank would have, right? A regional bank has all kinds of different businesses in it, right. uh, you know, a very diverse sort of bouquet of companies with different types of exposures. There was one right. sort of macro exposure across all these startup crypto-like, uh, you know, depositors. Agreed. Look, you, you could you could develop a portfolio that wasn't diverse, but that was very stable. Mm -hmm. Maybe you get a bunch of water utility companies. OK, there you go. you're not worried about them because they have a lot of cash flow, et cetera. Mm -hmm. These these. Um, the depositor base at Silicon Valley Bank was not only uniform, it was I use the word skittish. Correct. And that is the, this is all the cash they're going to get for a while. This is what they have to live on. And so. There are investors who have their ears to the ground, heard rumors of a run. That's all it took because they all talked to each other and they all made a headed for the bank to, to pull all their money out. And so then the next question, this goes to the management was incompetent, which was why we can all see this in retrospect. Uh, apparently, Kramer couldn't see it at the time because he was touting the bank not long oh, ago. He loves Signature Bank, too. Yeah. OK. Um, but I've also read that they didn't have a chief risk officer at the bank for eight or nine months. So the question is, why did they not see this coming sooner and take earlier steps? Because when they finally started to take the steps, it actually helped trigger the run. So I, to my mind, if this is a whodunit, instead of saying, I think it's more like murder on the Orient Express, excuse the spoiler. I think in a sense, all the suspects had a hand in it. Okay. Uh, but what's happening now is, as in Murder on the Orient Express, the way it ends is the detective lies to the police. He gives them a, a politically palatable answer, which is just simply false, and allows the culprits to move on. And I think that if we settle on you know, one, one politically palatable lie, we're not going to learn. If we don't learn, we're going to have more bodies piling up in the future. Well, it's already That's happening. Something. I mean, frankly, I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I would point this all back to the Fed. I mean, the Fed's policies are what kind of drove this behavior. It drove all the yield chasing for all these years. I mean, what is a bank supposed to do when there's no loan? I mean, I'll just kind of argue from the from the bank's perspective. They have to turn a profit. What are they spo supposed to do? I mean, traditionally, a bank would get deposits and I would loan those out at a higher interest rate than what I was paying out to guys. And I would right. earn that spread. That's how banking sort of initially worked. Well, right. when there's no loan demand because of COVID because businesses aren't, aren't expanding. And concurrently, there's a reduction in the level of reserves that a bank needs to hold on to. You know, we, we, we exist in a fractional reserve lending banking system. When those, re, when those reserves are, are reduced and the regulations on what 
my deposits can be invested in uh, are eliminated, diminished, whatever, it creates at least a moral hazard, if not a straight up incentive for a bank to chase yield to to construct any kind of spread that they can because they're a, they're a for-profit enterprise, you know? Well, there, there was a flood of money moving into the VCPE sector. Correct. Great point. And Silicon Valley Bank was the preferred bank. So yep. I, I guess they could have turned down the business. I'd say if you don't want to turn down the business, then you have to find a way to hedge it or essentially reinsure it so that you're not taking all the risk of this group of companies that is very skittish as, a, as depositors. Now, whether or not there were loan opportunities, I don't know. What I heard was that you know they had this huge base of low yield government debt that they had invested in that they couldn't liquidate without taking a giant haircut. So it seems to me that if you're looking for root causes in the same way that you know, failed harvest in France is really what caused Jean Valjean to try to steal the bread, okay? I'd say it was a combination of uh, the Fed goosing the credit markets for many years, yep. uh, which helped push all this money into all these startup things. Yep. And a lot of reckless spending by the federal government, particularly in the certain kinds of startup ventures that yep. sound really good and may change the world in 30 or 50 years, but which aren't necessarily going to be yielding any revenue anytime soon. So that, that's kind of where that happened. Then the question is, well, but, you know, why weren't the bankers smart enough to realize what was happening and to do something about it? We don't have the answer yet. I imagine someone's going to end up either in front of the Department of Justice or in front of the Banking Committee, and they can talk to Senator Warren about it. She won't be shy with her questions, but neither will the Republicans in this case. And, and that's actually going to be interesting because the Fed decided to bail out the depositors, even though they didn't have FDIC insurance. So th this is also kind of insult to injury, which is to say, well, not only are some banks big too big to fail, but it looks like some kinds of investors are too big to fail as well. And, and so part of what happens is when people fixate on the simple narrative is it's, it's a diversion from who really did what, who's, and they may continue to do it because there were no consequences. So I, you know, we started out on 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 compliance. We're into banking and and, and government policy, but uh, it's in some ways it's inevitable. But people are surprised when it happens. Yeah, it's true, and it's so it's so clear, kind of in retrospect. I guess maybe maybe it's not actually clear because um, there's so many different sort of narratives. Uh, and there's so many different arguments about what caused what and where the source of the problem is, and everything else, but. You know, I just kind of keep coming back to incentives, and either even from our, our, you know, the first part of our conversation to now, uh, into what you just said, if there's no change, like if there's no consequence, then what's the difference? Like, um, you know, the Fed stepping in to be the lender of last resort, okay, fine. If they're stepping yeah. in to be the backstop for failed banks, like okay, uh, if they're going to be sort of queuing till infinity, it's like all right, well, there's going to be some, there's going to be some implications to that, right? We're going to have more dollars chasing the same amount of goods. That's obviously going to re re result in the inflation. When we pull that yeah. back, there's such massive, massive exposure. Uh, when interest rates, you know, when rates go up, values go down. It's just how it works. Um, so, but, but then to your, to your, you know, the, the to the last point you made, they're now, you know, coming back in and sort of backstopping that, that again. So it's like, when does it end? They're kind of in a tough spot though because. Like they obviously don't want the economy to crash. They obviously don't want faith yeah. in the banking system to crash. We don't want a, a ripple effect of a thousand bank runs going on right. <laughs> across the whole country. So they kind of have to, it's, you know, I mean, I can see, you know, while I might not sort of agree with it on a sort of binary uh, level um, on a black and white level, I can at least understand the motivation to kind of keep the music playing so that, you know, this is a- uh, Bear in mind, you can't take your money out of the bank and put it in a mattress if you're a, a large corporation. Yeah, right. And this goes to partly the narrative. So if you believe in the deregulation narrative of Senator Warren, you're saying, well, why are why don't we see if this is a macroeconomic issue, you know, or a regulatory issue, why don't we see the field littered with these people? Why why isn't the field covered in dead bodies? Now maybe we saw the first two and you're saying, well, these are the first two of, of the plague that's gonna wipe us all out, but 
I don't, I don't see that right now. Uh, same thing with the wokeness, which is, you know what, there are probably other banks that are just as or more woke than Silicon Valley Bank. They haven't died yet. They're not dead yet. We'll, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fed policy is, is unfortunate, but how have other banks handled it that have done better, that have a, a more, uh, have a, a more diversified customer base with different horizons that aren't going to pull the money out, et cetera, that have either deep, deeper assets, what have you. So um, part of what happens initially, of course, is people suddenly start trying to price in a risk they haven't thought very hard about and the market goes. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Because the, there's all these, um, I mean, because that whole process is totally subjective. And that's where people make money. I'm waiting for Warren Buffett, who usually keeps 20% of his assets in cash because where he really makes his money is, he says that you don't know who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. Right. And so he's waiting for the tide go out because he's got swimsuits to sell or towels to sell at very, very, very high prices. Mm -hmm. And so we will see, I just, you know, people have to have a bank, right? You can't just take your money out of the bank and, and not do anything. I also don't know in the case of some of these regional banks or, or community banks, you know, what percentage of their deposits are already government insured. Yeah, right. Okay, so that's a, that, that's a different profile. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank seemed to have an unusually skittish customer base and, and seems to have made some poor unhedged decisions about its, its lending. Uh, I don't know how many others are similarly situated if some other people were smarter about the way they hedged. Uh, the other fact is, I guess some banks are considered to be systemically important, so they know that no matter what, the Fed's going to help them out. I read that Credit Suisse just got something like a 50 billion, 54 billion Swiss franc loan from the, the Bank of Switzerland. Wow. From the Swiss Central Bank. Yeah, their credit default swaps just like exploded mm -hmm. in the last few days. So we do know that the one thing these central banks know how to do is to inflate the economies with by printing money, but then you have to realize, well, inflation, you know, causes its own damage. Right. Right. And that is um it's a corrosive. And then at some point, you know, it's, the thing is eaten through the body of your car and suddenly your car falls apart. Right. And you thought, Hey, I thought it was looking pretty good. Um, so we, we will see. I, uh, the government has to quit spending so much money and the fed has to realize it can't simply goose the credit markets well below historical averages without a deleterious effect at some point down the road. But I'm not sure we have public servants who are thinking very far down the road. Yeah, maybe they should have to tie their whole uh, their whole wealth into uh, something like <laughs> like you're saying for the <laughs> for the boards right. and directors of companies or something. I don't know. I, I what I would love is for some senator on the, uh, the Justice Oversight Committee to say to the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, okay, I want to report on the compliance systems of the Department of Justice in line with what you're asking all these companies to do. So you go ask these, you go answer these two or 300 questions and you let me know what's going on. Cause one, you know, the joke is one of the biggest changes is this whole thing around communications preservation. Yeah, right. The, the inspector general of the department of justice issued a report about the Russia investigation. And they found that the senior DOJ people on the, on the investigation destroyed their personal communications devices. <laughs> So you can't I, I write like, this stuff. You just can't write it. I would like to, well, Kafka did, right? Uh, and, and Gogol, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 I would love to see, I would love the DOJ to have to eat its own cooking. And I, I wish there would be somebody in the Department of Justice who actually had a P&L to manage in a major corporation to say, you know what? You know, these companies have to function. They can't spend all their time staring at their navels. Yes, compliance is important. Yes, ethics is important. Okay, yes to all these things. But at, at some point, you just kind of scratch your head and you're saying, what were they thinking when they were writing this? Right. And who in the world is going to be actually able to, do they really expect someone out there to be able to answer yes to everything in the way they want it answered and still operate? I mean, that's a whole interesting kind of, you know, track to run down, that whole sort, sort of discussion. And the good that they're trying to do, are they actually... Uh, inadvertently ho holding the profession back uh, and ultimately holding sort of 
the potential sort of, um, you know, compliance uh, level, for lack of a better term, you know, lower than than what it what it could it could be. Look, they have a tough and important job. So, I'm, you know, which is they have to enforce the law, and they're getting increasingly prescriptive. And part of the question is, do they really have the competence to make these prescriptions, and then even to investigate them? So. What what the the guidelines and the thrust of a lot of modern compliance regulation is saying is that they they no longer want systems that are siloed by right. statutory areas. So most conventional ethics and compliance training is siloed by antitrust, environmental, workplace safety, uh, anti harassment, anti discrimination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where I do my training is where the DOJ is demanding what are really cross-functional skills, organizational design and, and incentives, and key, key performance indicators, culture building, process control and continuous improvement, and, uh, I have, and also crisis management, which involves communications flows as well. So th that's how the game has changed because of where the Department of Justice has moved to, as well as other regulators, is they want to see these cross-functional skills that really are not part of conventional ethics and compliance training. Now, the ethics and compliance training conventionally is extremely important. People have to know what this law says and this one and this one and this one. But now th they're expected to do this. Right. And, and that's kind of where I've been fo focusing the last few years in my you know, in my book and in my training and my speaking is, is in the cross-functional stuff that really not only drives the compliance, but it drives the business success. Right. Because if you have a lousy business culture, it's not just an ethical problem, it's an operational problem. And witness Wells Fargo. Okay, Wells Fargo, uh, for those who remember, you know, had about 5,000 people in a division opening 3 million phony accounts in the names of hundreds of thousands of customers. And that was because they had been given extremely strict KPIs by upper management to open up at least eight accounts per person. So credit card, mortgage, insurance, okay, et cetera. And so faced with these pressures, these people who are not highly compensated, they cheated. They created fake accounts by the millions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the woman in charge of the division just pled guilty and she's going to serve up to 16 months in prison and pay, I think, a $17 million fine. All right. What happened, though, is in the aftermath of that, the CEO Stumpf got fired by Warren Buffett, who was a, you know, the largest shareholder of Wells Fargo at the time. This, this woman actually was, was allowed to resign with her package intact, but then they, the government has clawed it back. And uh, But what you discovered was there was corruption throughout the bank. Shoes kept dropping because what happens is when you have a corrupt culture, it ain't in one place. When the, when you've got a CEO who is doesn't care about how people make the money, it's not just going to be in one division. And so, right. my view is that these cross-functional skills are about operations; they're about running a proper company that makes money. It's not just a question of not breaking the law, but you need these skills to make money. Now, the government isn't really so concerned about where's the marginal return on the next increment of compliance requirements in terms of how the company is going to function. And a question I raise in my Forbes column is I say, look, um, you, you haven't just created a prisoner's dilemma between the employees of the company and the company itself. A prisoner's dilemma is where the, the government or the police have two suspects and they're believed to participate in a joint crime. And they say to each suspect, okay, um, if you tell us, if you confess and rat on the other fellow, you can go free if he doesn't. If you don't confess and rat, but the other guy does, we're gonna hit you with you know 20 years in jail. Or if both of you confess and rat, each of you will do five. Now, they would both be better off not saying anything but the prisoner's dilemma creates a game theory situation where no matter what the other prisoner does, I'm better off ratting and confessing. Right. Because if he doesn't rat and confess, I walk scot-free. If he does rat and confess, I avoid a 20-year sentence. Okay. 
the government had been working towards this, but really what now they're developing with this important, with this new emphasis on voluntary disclosure and whistleblowing is they're creating a rat race, right? And the rat race says that's the first one who comes to us who gets the goodies. Right. And so then the question is, what is this going to do to how companies operate? Because the prisoner's dilemma assumes I have two prisoners in a sense with equal simultaneous knowledge, not only of the crime, but of what's going to happen. But the company doesn't know anything. The company, quote, only knows what its executives find out. So how is it? How is the company supposed to know something? Well, it's got to have reporting systems. And the question now I would have is, imagine you're advising someone in a corporation who thinks a wrongdoing has happened. And you're saying, well, should you go to the government or should you go report it into the, the reporting system? Pardon me. If you report it to the government, you might get money as a whistleblower. And you'll be sure to get what, and to the extent that any of this stuff splashes on you, you're going to get the best deal possible because you voluntarily disclosed, you blew right. the whistle. On the other hand, if you tell the company through its normal reporting systems what happened, the company may decide to voluntarily disclose and rat you out. Or what, what has happened is the government demands as part of voluntary compliance or cooperation, not just the list of the people who were substantially involved in something, but anybody who was involved. So if you had the knowledge to, of this, you must have been involved in some way. So what's going to happen? Well, your name is going to go on a list. And that list could go to the government and the government's going to investigate you. Now, maybe you did absolutely nothing, but you better lawyer up because the government, the company has every incentive to throw you to the wolves. Right. And maybe you'll be exonerated in two or three years after you're bankrupt from paying your lawyers. So that's the worst case scenario. Okay, what I'm just saying is that, that within the government's design is this rat race. It's not a prisoner's dilemma anymore, it's a rat race. How will that affect how organizations operate? And for what marginal improvement involuntary disclosure will we accept what marginal decline in internal corporate operation i don't know what the answer is i mean we're, what we're going to see is we're going to see a very large experiment of how this is going to play out uh, maybe nothing's going to battle happen and maybe this will be a boon to everybody and all will be sweetness and light i simply don't know but i, I look at this and i say okay we're not in a prisoner's dilemma anymore toto we're, we're in a rat race what's going to happen here yeah, and yeah, a rat I mean, race has a much different incentive structure than a prisoner's dilemma. So it's going to be interesting so. to see uh, how I that all so. responds, you know what I'm saying, or how, how that all plays out. So what, what this gets to, of course, is if you're representing the corporation, the firm, you need to make sure that you have the best compliance reporting systems you can. Uh, you need to have case management systems. You need to have hotlines. You need to lower the transaction costs of people bringing information to you. Yeah, Which I you, think is something you know. And you got to actualize those people to where they believe that if they say something, some, something's going to be done about it. So there has to, you know, you want to talk about incentives, right? The most, uh, you know, the worst incentive you can provide is one where um, it doesn't drive the behavior you want. <laughs> and so, uh, simply yeah. by sharing um, what happens when somebody speaks up, show, you know, showing that we simply, you know, don't tolerate um, retaliation or there are rewards implicit or otherwise uh, yeah. for, for people speaking up. It allows you to kind of engage them in a culture that, um, or allows you to engage them in the culture that can start to become self-reinforcing. And then you get those positive externalities of all these human sensors walking around your organization. Because otherwise, it's, it's rat race time, you know? Well, I, I was a, a college student in the former Soviet Union for a while. And you, you want to avoid a culture of informants. You're right. right, right. So you need to, you know, you want people to be motivated. What motivates people is virtue culture. They want to feel that doing their job contributes to their self-esteem and their self-actualization. Some of that is financial and much of it is psychological, which is, do I feel good about myself? Does doing well at work make me feel better about myself? A large part of that is going to be, do, am I proud to work here? Am I motivated to work here? So this is where the um, where the, the challenge for the, the firms is getting 
harder in terms of what the government's requiring. I suspect that part of the response from all this is that people are going to, so to speak, flood the zone. In other words, the government could find itself inundated with so much stuff it'll never get through. Right. right. So, uh, you know, okay, you know, we're going to, because the, what the, what the businesses, the advice for the businesses is going to be, look, as soon as you find out something is wrong, let the government know, tell them you're doing, you'd like their permission to complete your investigation. The fact is the government is, is considers itself to be under-resourced and overstretched. And if they start getting millions of whistleblower complaints and they start getting tens or hundreds of thousands of preliminary notices from corporations, right. uh, they're just going to be flooded and they're not going to have time to look at all this stuff. And they're going to say, okay, you know, go after it and call me when you get back. Well, I call am, uh, I am excited to do our, uh, our webinar together because every time we do one of these, um, I don't know, they're just, uh, they're great. You have, uh, so much wisdom to share and, um, I don't know. I just always enjoy these conversations with you. Um, I would encourage everyone to go pick up your book, uh, The Right Way to Win. Uh, I love the book. We're adding it to the Ethico uh, Library officially. Where can everybody else find you, Robert? Uh, my website is <laughs> www.therightwaytowin.com. And so I have a number of uh, online training materials, one-hour mini course, a more in-depth course, et cetera, which is focused on these cross-functional skills that really I think no one else is focused on in terms of ethics and compliance. Yeah, it is a, it's, it's a unique innovation because to your point, we tend to have these really siloed trainings uh, when in actuality we really, we want to have a more holistic program. It can start with putting kind of a more holistic perspective in the minds of the people that we want to be human censors in our company. The government is demanding it, but the fact is that business success requires it. So my approach is to say, look, the same managerial tools and techniques that drive ethical behavior also drive long-term business success. And my background, I am a lawyer, but I, I was a McKinsey consultant for several years. I was an entrepreneur. I was in Russia when bankers were getting blown up on Main Street. So I, I look at this as a business person would, but I try to bring some legal tools and some consulting tools to the training. But this is about making businesses run better. And ethics and, and compliance are an important part of that. But at the end of the day, the company has to make some money or it's worthless. Right. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Always a pleasure. Un until next time.